Joining me now is New York Governor Kathy Hochul, a Democrat. Uh, Governor, let's start with the fatal shooting of New York City police officer Jonathan Diller, which has dominated the news in uh, your state since his death on Monday. Uh, former President Donald Trump attended the wake on Long Island Thursday. Yesterday, you went to the wake as well, and you met with family members. The tragedy obviously sparked a debate about crime, guns, and criminal justice, and uh, many of us deplore the shooting of policemen. You've been consistent with that, but also consistent with everyone must stay within the law. What can you share about your thoughts on these issues as crime statistically has gone down in your state, but what do we need to do more of? Well, thank you, Reverend, uh, for having me back on the show. And yesterday and today, the day of the funeral, it's, it's been a heartbreaking experience for all New Yorkers. We grieve with this family, especially a young widow who has a one-year-old son who will be raised without his father because of the horrific acts by a brazen criminal. And I went to, to the wake to meet the family and speak to everyone from his wife and mother, father, brothers, sisters. Everyone is just... Uh, so distraught. And yes, there's a lot of anger. Understandably, there's anger about how these individuals who commit crimes over and over are back out on the streets again. So that's one of the reasons we worked hard with the legislature last year to change the bail laws so the judges have more discretion. And, you know, there's a lot of complicated factors here, but I totally understand the outrage of the family. I do. And we're working hard to keep crime down. But speaking of our efforts... You know what we've done in the subways, Reverend Al. We were there together talking about it uh, a couple weeks ago. We first deployed the National Guard, which there was a lot of criticism of. But these are simply people that are as a deterrent, a presence. Crime has gone down since we added them to the force that our uh, Mayor Adams has brought in reinforcements. And so it's necessary to calm it all down. We changed the laws last year. Recidivism is down 40 percent. We're getting more guns off the street, but we have so much more work to do. And that's why my plan before the legislature brings more money for law enforcement, district attorneys, diversion programs, alternative courts, so we can get young people off the streets and into programs before they get hardened and and are places we can never pull them back from. So it's comprehensive. It's something we are focused on day in and day out. But today we mourn this, the life of this wonderful young man who was willing to put his life on the line to protect all of us so we can sleep better at night. And so we, we respect police and law enforcement here in the state of New York. And one of the things that we're trying to deal with is the balance, because the, the killing of this policeman is horrible. And then we have an NYPD shooting of a young man with uh, uh, issues uh, that his family said he had. So the balance of trying, I don't think it's one side or another. We need to stop all of the violence against our law enforcement, but also hold accountability at the same time of law enforcement. But let me go to this issue. New York's uh, budget deadline has been pushed back to next week as lawmakers continue to negotiate over priorities, including Democratic proposals to increase funding for education, provide more affordable housing, and protect retail workers from crime. What can you tell us about where the talks stand this evening? Happy to talk about They've been very productive, and I wanted to change the whole culture here in Albany to not be so contentious, to to fight for what we believe in, but ultimately we have to deliver for New Yorkers. We have to get them a budget. Now, on time was a little bit complicated since the deadline literally is Easter Sunday. We knew it was going to go into more days next week to accommodate our observance of this this holy holiday. So that's fine. Uh, We're not going to go very late. I want to get this done. But one of the biggest problems we have, other than making sure we have enough resources to fight crime and to drive down uh, repeat offenders, is to go after the crimes that are driving people crazy, like like retail theft. I have a whole package on how we can deal with the people who are sweeping the toothpaste off the shelves and the detergent and the diapers and not using them for themselves, but selling them online as part of a larger criminal enterprise. That's what we're going after as well. And I'm working on all those details. But you mentioned housing, Reverend. This is one of the greatest challenges we have in the state of New York, is to stop people from digging their heels in and being so myopic, so nimby, that we cannot build enough housing for the families, particularly black and brown families that have been fleeing the city of New York 
simply because they can't find housing that's affordable. I want New York to be a place where people of all incomes and all races and all ethnicities can find a home, and I want to get that building started now. So I'm unrelenting in this. I'm going to be continuing to work with the legislature and saying we should not be leaving here until we show a real commitment to giving people, everyone, the dignity of a home and focusing on our homelessness, but also making sure the young people coming in search of those great tech jobs that we're creating have a place to live. Now, switching topics here. You are part of a group of nearly two dozen governors defending abortion rights after the fall of Roe. And, th and this week, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments about whether access to a drug used in more than half in, uh, the abortions in the U.S. should be restricted, with the court appearing likely to preserve that access over the objections of anti-abortion doctors. It seems like a prospective win for your group, uh, the Reproductive Freedom Alliance, three months after it filed an amicus brief urging the court to do so. What is your reaction tonight ahead of its decision? Well, we won't know for sure until June, but it's shocking to me that we even had to get to the Supreme Court, that there was a judge, a Trump-appointed judge in Amarillo, Texas, who decided that he knew more than the scientists at the FDA, that he could overrule their judgment. So I have said, leave the science to the scientists, the medicine to the doctors, and leave women's bodies to the women. I mean, let's stop having these absurd conversations. And yes, I expect we should win in court in June, but all the time and energy around this, when you realize if you look at recent polling, the vast majority of even Republicans want this. So you look at it through the political lens, Republicans, this is political suicide for you. Leave women alone. Find a way to restore the rights with a national, not a ban on abortion like Donald Trump wants, but saying abortion rights are the law of the land here in the United States of America. Women have had it. Women will mobilize politically. They'll march to the polls in November, and there'll be consequences for the Republican Party because they didn't just go after abortion, surgical abortion. They went after medication abortion, which is almost two-thirds of all abortions in this country. And they went after IVF for the people that are struggling to start a family. There is no limit to the ways that they have found to diminish women, to subjugate them. And I say, just leave us alone. Now, the president's re-election, you just brought up the election. President's re-election campaign says it hauled in more than... $26 million from its fundraiser across the street from here at Radio City Music Hall on Thursday night. Uh, President Biden was joined by former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, the three of them showing uh, uh, together and standing, throwing shots at Donald Trump and trying to calm pro-Palestinian protesters who interrupted the event uh, several times to criticize the president's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. Now, you couldn't attend the event, but from what I hear uh, and what you hear, how would you characterize the importance of this joint effort uh, for the president and the Democratic Party with the former president standing with him on the stage? Reverend, I would have loved to have been there, but we were in the throes of our budget negotiations. So that's the only thing that kept me away from really what is a, a gigantic pep rally for people to get energized and get excited about the Biden-Harris presidency and re-election. So the timing is perfect. It is the end of March. We have a long campaign time. And for the president to be able to, first of all, stand with his predecessors and talk about the common values of the Democratic Party, which we've never lost sight of, and how we stand so apart from what has happened to the Republican Party, how the issues that should have been just American issues, like working to support women's rights and infrastructure projects and creating jobs, how this all gets taken into a different place by the Republicans. Everything is so political to them. So I thought it was great. It's perfect for the momentum. I commend the Biden campaign team for putting this together to show that there's a lot of energy and excitement around this candidacy. And I thought the president was spot on. I had a chance to watch it afterward. Uh, he's funny, he's engaging, he's warm, and all those traits that are what we need right now to calm things down and get this country back to where it was before Donald Trump ever entered the political scene. It was necessary. It calms the nerves of a lot of Democrats who are getting a little anxious. Everybody just calm down. 
President Biden's doing just fine. I've met with him many times, and he's going to continue to be the, the voice of reason and wisdom and experience that we need to get through a lot of these challenges. Before I let you go, New York is one of only three states where the historic total solar eclipse on April 8th will be visible. I learned that many of the state's prison inmates have requested to observe uh, the generational event, uh, some citing its religious significance. But the New York Department of Corrections and Community Supervision has planned a system-wide three-hour lockdown. The Department of Corrections says the religious requests are under review. Should they be granted, Governor? Well, we are very excited about April 8th. I'll be right at the epicenter of it in Niagara Falls watching it. But we are making accommodations for the, the minimum security prisons and the middle uh, security. But the maximum security prisons, uh, we're going to try to find a way that people can observe. We'll have the glasses available to everybody for people watching indoors. We'll, we'll figure it out. But also, you know, our job is public safety. And if there's a three-and-a-half-minute time when the, the prisons descend into complete darkness and people are outside, we have to be smart about how we handle this. But we're listening to the request for rigid religious accommodations. But I have to say, I have to keep people safe first. And I don't want to be uh, finding out later there was some people got clever about the darkness in the middle of the day and were able to do things. Uh, we've seen enough prison breaks, and I want to make sure that we're being smart about this. But we're listening to those requests. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.